All of you would have uh, attended uh, enough uh, analyst meets on WebEx by now, and therefore I'm sure that you are very comfortable and also realize that it works quite well uh, if you have proper bandwidth. So uh, let me uh, first uh, take the for you the formality of introducing the new team. Uh, of course, you know them all. Uh, Rajesh Jizurkar, you have met uh, many times. Uh, he has presented to you as uh, president of FES business. Uh, today, he will talk to you as the executive director of AFS. Takes over that responsibility from April 1st. Anissa, you know very well. He has not participated formally in these analyst meets before, but he has met many of you over the last four or five months, and therefore, I'm sure you know him very well. He will present uh, in his capacity as Group CFO. <clears throat> the Mahindra board met today uh, virtually again, uh, uh, as all the board meetings have been for the last uh, two and a half months and approved the financial results of uh, fourth quarter and the full year 2000 FY20. You have already seen the press release and I'm sure analyzed the data, uh, the headline numbers. Uh, in the next 45 minutes or so, uh, Anis and Rajesh will take you through insights uh, on these numbers and give you all the details uh, that you may want. And also after that, we will have almost an hour uh, for questions and answer. Anand uh, has joined already. Uh, he will participate in the Q&A. Undoubtedly, uh, the last three months uh, perhaps have been the most challenging months for anyone, uh, professionally, uh, in business, personally, uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, and the industry uh, that we are in, uh, the, the core industry of tractor and automotive, uh, have already uh, have undoubtedly suffered uh, because of that. Uh, in a tractor business, uh, going into the fourth quarter, we're expecting a strong recovery. Uh, moving from what was about minus 10% growth till quarter three uh, to a minus 5% with a positive 20 20% 20 or so in quarter four. But instead, quarter four also was a deep growth, uh, clearly impacted because of what happened in the last uh, 10 days or so in the month of March, which was which is the highest selling time, one of the highest selling time for the tractor business. In the auto business, uh, Q4 was supposed to be subdued anyways because of BS6 uh, transition that was, uh, that was happening in that quarter. Uh, but the, the, the problems started almost in mid-February uh, when some of the companies, including Mahindra, faced the supply problems from China. After that, specifically for Mahindra, we had a fire in one of our major suppliers. And after that, of course, we had the lockdown. And therefore, the industry in quarter four was down by 22%. Uh, uh, in the middle of all of this, we obviously had to have the BS6 uh, transition, and that also uh, took its toll. Uh, you will see uh, that in spite of uh, fairly uh, sharp impact on volume and uh, therefore revenue, uh, for Mahindra and Mahindra, the operating performance was very good, and uh, we will walk you through the detail. Uh, in fact, uh, our operating margin uh, remained same as the year before. Uh, that, I believe, is a remarkable uh, achievement when we have seen such a huge reduction in volume. Uh, we increased the market share in the tractor. Uh, Rajas will talk about that and also in the CV, uh, CV segment. Uh, and also we managed the operating cash flow uh, quite well. At the same time, did the BS6 uh, transition seamlessly. So all of these things, Rajas will take you through the details. Uh, we have taken some hard calls, uh, as you would have already seen uh, with Sangyong, of not uh, investing anymore in Sangyong. Also, we have taken a decision to exit the electric scooter and bike business in USA called Zen Z, uh, and carefully examining all the other loss-making uh, entities, especially uh, overseas entities. Uh, and we have also done enough borrowing uh, to uh, at very attractive rates, in fact, uh, to have a very strong cash position uh, to face any kind of uh, situation that may arise over the next uh, few months. The opening up has started, and I just will take you through where we are on the tractor business and automotive business as we open up, and Anish will take you through all the financial details. So with that, let me hand over to uh, Rajesh first to take you to the operational performance, and after that to Anish uh, for financial performance. I will come back for a closer, and then we'll open up for Q&A. Rajesh? Good afternoon, all of you. Good afternoon, all of you, and uh, welcome to this Analyst Meet presentation, which as Pavan said, we're doing in the remote mode here today. So uh, the way we're structuring this is to talk first about the FES uh, performance highlights in the period F20, uh, then the auto, and then uh, talk a little about the future direction and our priorities in the auto and the farm space. Uh, so let's start with some news around 
uh, the awards that the farm equipment business has got. Uh, many of you know that the farm equipment business is very well known uh, for its quality standards and the deming. And this year we went on uh, to also get the be the first in the world to win the TPM Advanced Special Award awarded for our lean manufacturing and manufacturing 4.0. Uh, connecting not just a plant but and for the entire business uh, we also have got uh, the most trusted brand and the most customer focused brand uh, awards in the year 2019 and uh, we continue to be very strong on customer satisfaction both the brand mahindra and swaraj being number one and number two JDPA. some highlights for the farm equipment business as pavan just shared, said gained one share point market share taking us to 41.2 uh, in an industry which was down about 10 percent uh, we delivered a very good uh, profit margin performance with a pbit margin of 19 percent and a pbit in absolute terms of 2926 crores in the early part of the year in January, we uh, pilot or test launched, uh, which has now been rolled out, the launch of the new Plus series, uh, which are upgrades uh, both in looks and as well in performance of our uh, diehard old strong models, the Bhumi Putra and Sarpanch, and both have been getting very, very good reviews in the marketplace and very good feedback. Uh, the U.S. tractor business billings grew by 9.3 percent to a level of 15,600, and in Turkey, the Arkon brand uh, gained about a share point and was between number three and number four player during parts through the year. This slide is uh, mainly to illustrate the impact uh, that the COVID business had on the tractor uh, side of the business. Uh, as you can see here. Uh, we were looking at a very optimistic quarter four. And things were going very well. We started seeing a turnaround in the tractor space starting December onwards. And our assessment of the volume that we lost in the last 10 days, um, just to remind all of you who track this closely, uh, that was the last 10 days of March was a peak buying season because uh, in the northern part of the country, it was Navratra and there was Gudi Padwa in Maharashtra and Karnataka. Uh, so it was a very positive buying period and uh, this is straight away the loss that we could see happen over the last 10 days of march which led to an impact on the pbit of about 194 crores in that context uh, let's look at the resilience in the performance we often show you this chart which brings out the stability of our margin performance uh, in an industry we all know to be very volatile F20 saw one of its uh, downturn years, uh, followed by uh, F19, which uh, was uh, minus 10% growth, and yet we were able to maintain a margin of 19% in these times, and also uh, gain market share in this period of time. Moving on to auto and some highlights. Uh, our Commercial vehicles market share went up by three points uh, to a level of 27.7. Of course, this is a mathematical calculation. The commercial vehicle definition here includes four wheelers uh, starting from less than two tons going up to medium and heavy commercial vehicles. Our pickups continue to do well and small commercial vehicles did well as well. Uh, the UV segment, we had a market share of 19 and we lost some share point and talk more about that as we come to the way forward. Uh, the automotive business again had a very strong margin performance with an OPM of 13%. We're in complete readiness on BS6. Mahindra Electric had an EBITDA break-even in the year F20. Trio crossed 4,000 numbers and is now in more than 70 cities. On the auto side, the retails have been much better than the billing. And uh, as you can see, that translated into a dealer stock of only 10,000 numbers. And that is probably amongst the lowest dealer stocks we've had uh, going back in recent memory. Uh, again, a very strong performance on customer satisfaction and sales satisfaction indexes of JD Park. We also have best in class IQS score for Marazzo. 
So overall, many strong points as we look at F20. Let's now try and understand uh, the point Pavan was making in his opening talk, which is what really happened to quarter four volumes. Quarter four F19, we had a volume of 174,000. We were expecting an industry slowdown and our volume was expected to go down by about 38,000 on account of that. But three other factors came into play. Uh, we had a major disruption uh, starting from February, mainly from the China uh, supplies. That was uh, equal to losing about 16,000 vehicles. There was a fire at our uh, one of our key suppliers, uh, and that happened in February as well, uh, which again led to a loss of 6,500 vehicles. And then, of course, the last 10-day lockdown was another 23,000 vehicles. Uh, so in a way, that explains how 174,000 vehicles came down to 90,500 vehicles. Just the COVID impact of that on the PBIT was 470 crores uh, impact. Moving on to the resilience of the auto sector. And again, here you can see how consistently the operating margins have been maintained in spite of a fall of 22% uh, in volume this year and giving us a best in class margin of 30%. A little bit on the Ford uh, joint venture uh, and the alliance. Just recapping the potential benefits. The potential benefits here have been uh, co-sharing of investments and technologies. We clearly see that playing out. Uh, economies of scale in joint sourcing. There's strong evidence of that on both sides, how Mahindra has gained on some of its newer projects from the oversight or the uh, overview that Ford was able to bring in, and likewise for projects which are impacting the joint. Uh, we're seeing a lot of momentum on joint product development and capacities uh, and capacity utilization is under discussion many agreements are already signed on dr driving joint product development and of course the biggest and most important potential benefit is the potential of exporting uh, products to the ford ecosystem especially in emerging markets uh, there has been a delay in the start of the joint venture um, due to the COVID. And we could talk more about that if you all like at the QA. I'm now moving on and talking about the future directions of the farm equipment sector to begin with. As I do that, I'd first like to give you all an update on where we are today. Uh, we see a very, very strong ruler opportunity uh, that has uh, been enabled by very good reservoir levels, very good. Uh, rubby output, both in quality and quantity, and a significant increase in government spending. Uh, we have an, a, you know, an internal index, which we call the Rural Spending Index, uh, configured by our economists. And that is showing uh, its highest level in many, many, many quarters. And we are seeing the evidence of that play out in the marketplace, where demand for everything in rural right now is very robust. On the tractor side, hence the key challenge is how we ramp up operations. Uh, more than 90% of our dealers have started. Our plants are now operating at more than 80% capacity. We have aligned financiers very well starting in May itself and building on further in the month of June. We have new products which are in the pipeline. I spoke about a couple of them, and we believe that will give us a strong footing and help us strengthen our position in the marketplace. There's also a mechanization opportunity we've been talking about, and that's clearly playing out. And while it may sound counterintuitive that if labor is moving back to their homes and villages, why would mechanization grow? And one explanation for that is that there will be a big regional skew. So for example, if labor which was working in Punjab in their farms has moved back to, say, Bihar, uh, that's going to throw up mechanization opportunities in a state like Punjab, and so on. So there will be a kind of matching of states to opportunity as we go forward.
We have listed here some of our key priorities for the farm equipment sector. First and the most important one is to strengthen our core business. And while we will do that with our core tractor business, and you're already seeing that we have been able to do that uh, while protecting our margins and gaining market share, a significant part of our strategy is to build a moat for our domestic business through farming as a service. And I'll talk a little more on that in the next slide also focus on building our farm machinery India business. The other project which is very significant in the way we see our future is the K2 project and I'll talk more on that in a minute. A significant priority is around turning around the global businesses and uh, I will talk a little about what we're planning to do in the US tractor business uh, but that is a very important priority. So moving on to Krishi. Krishi is the branding we're using for farming as a service. Uh, Krishi is a combination of a revamped Samriddhi center combined with precision farming, rental models, and really working very closely with farmers on helping make a difference to productivity and yield. Uh, many of the precision farming initiatives we've been piloting for the last two years, be it smart sugarcane harvesting, uh, smart fertilization for potatoes, where we've uh, piloted on uh, more than 2,500 acres and got very good results, almost 60% reduction in fertilization cost and a 90% repeat rate are all evidence of the impact that we could create through an initiative like this. Uh, so this is really combining digital precision farming kind of technologies uh, along with on-ground presence. Uh, Krishi will be a part of our channels uh, and that's the way we believe we will create a stronger customer engagement and a greater moat for our core business of tractors and farm machines. So Krishi will be called Krishi by Mahendra when it's in the Mahendra channel and Krishi by Swaraj when it's in the Swaraj channels. Uh, Pavan had spoken about Project K2 uh, last quarter. Project K2 is an ambitious and a significant project uh, aimed at uh, creating lightweight global platform, something that we don't have adequately in our portfolio today. It's a collaborative project between Mitsubishi Mahindra Ag Machinery teams in Japan and the Mahindra Research Valley teams in Chennai. Uh, we aim to create four new platforms uh, which are global in nature and uh, which start from 13 horsepower going up all the way to 70 horsepower uh, for markets like USA, Southeast Asia, India and Japan. Uh, we've been working on this for the last year and a half already and uh, we should start seeing uh, the first of the platforms a uh, year and a half or two now. Uh, the North American tractor business is a very important part of our turnaround action. Many actions have been taken in the year F20. Uh, we are very confident that we will be able to break even by F22. Uh, we fixed most of the transition issues. Uh, price and value proposition was a concern. In F20, we still had transition issues because we had old stocks uh, of higher prices in the pipeline. We've now adjusted prices for all of those. We're seeing a very, very good retail momentum in April and May. And again, counterintuitive as it may sound, uh, the North American market for tractors is actually uh, growing very well, and so are we in the COVID era. Uh, and mainly because you can imagine people are spending more time in their farms rather than in their urban locations. Uh, a lot of actions are underway and have been taken on restructuring our costs and a much more focus on digital marketing uh, rather than mass media marketing. Now talk about the future direction of the automotive business. And we're using the approach here of walk run and fly. The period walk is the one we are in right now, which is April to August. Clearly the priority has been to conserve cash and we've taken all necessary actions to manage our cash and our costs very well. 
as we are in this period april to august we think there are some segments which will respond faster than others rural is clearly one of them we're seeing huge rural momentum and fortunately for us and i think we are well placed on this matter uh, we have a very strong rural portfolio more than 40, 45 50% of our volumes are from rural scorpio and bolero have a very strong rural presence and so does pick up so we believe we have a portfolio which can fully leverage rural demand uh goods mobility is a segment which is opening up and so is b2b corporates and um, government buying uh, especially in the area of people mobility uh, because those are solutions that organizations are going to need as things start opening up in the economy uh dealer and supplier financial health is an area we have focused on uh to make sure our network and our supplier partners are healthy and do not cause uh, disruption as we ramp up currently on the auto side we are at 30% of our manufacturing capacity uh as uh, many of you know we started automotive plants later than the tractor plant but 100% of our suppliers are now operational and more than 80% of our dealer network is operational the next phase is run and that we calling as the september to march uh, we have been focusing and are focusing on a strategic reprioritization of capex uh aggressive cost optimization and uh, many new lessons learned during the shutdown which make us believe that we can do business very differently and we believe uh, when we say strategic reprioritization it is how do you reprioritize capex without taking away strategic objectives for the long term uh, so we are not cutting anything which is strategic to our core and strategic to our long term growth uh, we believe that in the future we will be able to optimize capex in the auto business significantly for two reasons one we have already invested in all the new platforms power trains aggregates uh all of that investment has been done over the last 3 or 4 years secondly synergy with ford will allow us much greater level of commonality and platform usage uh so we believe uh, we will be able to deliver our long term objectives with lesser apex going forward from the f22 cycle an important initiative and we believe uh, this is a flagship initiative is the launch of the thar Uh, the new thar brings back the core we believe it will create a new category uh, which brings in the core product of mahindra which comes in variety wide variety wide uh, level of refinement aggregates automatic all the works uh, which will create a new segment uh, the product we believe is really looking good and performing very well uh, we hope to launch that by the uh early part of the first uh, second half of the year uh also uh bolero will be a volume driver for us xuv300 the feedback from customers and our network is very very positive on design and performance including gasoline and we believe again we have a good volume opportunity to drive the xuv300 business as we move into the run phase uh, we are redefining the business model of the dealers uh reducing the footprint and figuring out newer ways by which we can achieve the same impact by creating better viability for the dealers as we move on to talk about new products and moving into the fly phase which is f22 a very important part of our strategy is to build a distinctive suv brand which is coming back to the core of what my idea is uh we believe we have a very strong brand and a very strong heritage and uh, we our products will reflect uh, that brand dna uh the bolero is one of the products which does that and then of course we will have the new thar and the two new models which should be launched in the early part of f22 and maybe w601 may come by the end of f21 is the w601 and the z11 as we do that we are also going to be focusing on a new pickup which where we are very strong in and supro where we are seeing 
uh, traction both for passenger and goods mobility uh, in the post-COVID era. Uh, we have a full-fledged EV portfolio strategy in place, and we believe that we will maintain a strong position on the commercial side in the short run, providing solutions for uh, mobility operators. And then, of course, we will talk more holistically about EV portfolio strategy as we move forward. In the auto business as well, path to profitability for global subsidiaries is a very important criteria. Uh, platform synergy I already spoke about. We believe that will optimize our capex and through optimizing capex and managing our cost structure better, we hope to improve our margin of safety quite significantly in the auto business. So if I was to summarize the walk, run and fly for the auto and farm sectors combined. We're at the stage where managed cash is the most important priority. Anish will talk more about that. Uh, we will bring core working capital back to normal. We are optimizing CapEx in the current year, though most of the benefits of that will come in the year F22. Uh, better management of margin. We already have very healthy NVMs. We will want to improve our net variable margins a very, very stringent cost management in F21, revisiting many paradigms on what is acceptable level of spends. And of course, doing all of that while managing safety. I already spoke about focus on domestic core, which is in the period September to March, you start seeing more of that with the launch of THAR, as I said, CapEx and investment prioritization, the Krishi E initiative, which we believe is very fundamental to our long-term strategy, and more actions which simplify the business, bring greater agility, and manage cost better. As we move into Fly, the SUV core brand differentiation, the launch of a new UO star, and the K2 launches start. A digital trans transformation initiative, we already launched Mahindra own online, in the auto side, uh, we've just launched a tractor on a digital platform through M2ALL. Uh, the Mahindra own online on the auto side is getting very good traction, has already had 1.65 lakh visitors in the short time that we've launched it. And of course, leverage platform synergy to optimize CapEx. You can see turnaround global businesses as a common thread uh, and an important part of what we are expecting to focus on. In uh, the short term, it will be about managing cash, and next year, it will be about fully leveraging the new auto launches uh, to live up to our brand and the core of our brand here. Thank you, Anish, and thank you, Apavan. Do you want to sum up before we? No, uh, let me see, then I will sum up. Anish, uh, please. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, would have loved to be there in person, and uh, hopefully that will happen fairly soon. Uh, but for now, we shall uh, rely on our electronic format. So let's start with uh, key messages that uh, I'd like to cover today. First is, as Rajesh covered, the resilient performance for domestic auto and farm in a tough year. What you will see in our numbers is that Sangyong and other international subsidiaries drive a very significant reduction in profit. We'll talk about a strong cash position to tackle COVID and any uncertainties. And the question that you are going to have is, what are the actions and are they really going to be tough actions underway to reignite value creation? And what does reignite mean? So that's something I'll cover as well. So moving forward then, starting with F20 results. A quick snapshot of our operating performance and why we call it resilient. Revenue is down 15%. Excluding COVID and BS6, it's down 8%. Similarly, EBITDA down 16 and 5, respectively. And profit before tax, before exceptional items, down 23% on an actual basis. And excluding the impact of COVID and BS6, down 12%. More important, though, is operating margins were maintained at 14.2% in a tough environment. Cash generated was close to 4,000 crores, 3,946 to be exact. 
farm market share was up, as Rajesh talked about, and auto LCV less than three and a half ton market share was up 1.2% as well. Both of these are significant numbers because market share for both of these are in the 40s. And at that level, raising market share is not easy, uh, while maintaining margins, of course. So that's really why we call this as resilient. Moving forward then, here's where we see numbers we don't like at all. Uh, and will we look at PAT after AI standalone first, Q4 to Q4 on the left-hand side, and then we'll move to full year on the right-hand side. We start with F19 Q4 at 969. Uh, what you see here is that the farm business would actually have been 250 positive had it not been for COVID. Despite COVID, it is still 56 crore positive versus last year, same quarter. The auto business is down 697. And without COVID, it would have been down, but by a much lesser margin. The third is where the trouble is for our financials this year, is international subsidiaries for auto and farm. That is lower by 2,719 crores, largely driven by impairments and the, the bulk of this is driven by uh, Sangyong and Gen Z. 80% is driven by Sangyong and Gen Z. Uh, the good news here is that both have been addressed. We are not going to invest in Sangyong anymore. Uh, there will likely be a new investor who comes in and uh, we will be down to a minority stake or possibly a no stake over time. And uh, Gen Z, we have shut down. So 80% has been addressed. Remaining 20% has to be addressed, and we will talk about how we're doing that. And the fourth category there is investments. So the way we've shown this is domestic farm, domestic auto, international subsidiaries for auto and farm, and investments is all our listed and unlisted subsidiaries, including Tech M, Mahindra Finance, Holidays, Real Estate, and, and various unlisted subsidiaries. Uh, there is a hit on the investment side in this quarter as well. But as we go to the full year, uh, there, what we see is, again, international subsidiaries driving uh, the vast majority of the delta. And uh, investments in that case is slightly positive, driven by some upside that we had in the first three quarters of the year. Moving to consolidated, uh, we see a very similar story, where if we were to stay only with domestic auto and farm, and investments, we would have been down only 4% on a PAT basis. But that's where Sangyong and other international subsidiaries come in. And that takes away almost all of the profit. And a little of what's remaining is taken away by a goodwill impairment, leaving us with 127 crores. So there again, the core operating business is doing well. It's strong. The international subsidiaries is what we need to address. Looking at revenue, uh, Q4 to Q4 walk shows us negative 9% pre-COVID and negative 35% on an actual basis. On a full year, it's negative 8% pre-COVID and negative 15% on an actual basis. The highlight again is operating margins, up 10 basis points for the quarter and flat for the full year. So as a result, our operating profit, really, as we call it, the profit before tax, before EI, uh, started at 7,011 crores last year. Uh, we see some impact due to COVID and uh, some losses due to auto and farm, uh, minor losses due to investment, uh, net impact negative 23% on an actual basis and negative 12% pre-COVID or pre-BS6 impact. The question that many of you have asked before is whether we are investing enough in our auto and farm businesses. Are we taking money from there and putting them in investments elsewhere? So what we're going to show you on a regular basis is what are we doing with our cash? We started the year at 7,797 opening cash. Auto contributed 4,300 crores from an operating standpoint. 
and we invested 4,447 in capex in auto and farm. Uh, investments in that same space were 1698. So auto and farm were net users of cash to the use of to the tune of 1843 crores. Our investments were a net giver of cash to the tune of 1895 crores, and as we use cash and dividend. Our closing cash was 6,928 or close to 7,000 crore. Uh, what I will emphasize here is that uh, we were actually negative on a net debt standpoint uh, significantly by 3,400 crores uh, at the end of the year. We have uh, increased our cash balance substantially through further accruals as well as uh, through some more debt we've raised. We continue to stay negative on a debt basis, but our current cash position as of today is 10,300 crores plus 2,250 crores of, of committed lines. So we are sitting with cash of 12,550 crores today. And uh, that is again with a net debt position of negative, uh, putting us in a very good space to be able to tackle COVID or any uncertainties that we may face. In summary, a resilient performance of domestic auto and farm in a tough year. Highlights are market share gains, operating margins, and a profit impact, but hold it, held up fairly well um, despite BS6 and COVID. What we didn't hold up well at all was these losses driven by Sangyong and international subsidiaries. Uh, and as I talked about the cash balance, we, we are in a pretty strong position there. So let's talk now about what are the actions to create value and what are the actions to address our international subsidiaries? Let's go back in time for that. Starting with 2002, the Nifty was born at that point, as was the Blue Chip Conference at Mahindra. At that conference, there was a very emotional appeal to lift our performance and make our stock price reflect our genuine potential. Over the next 17 years, till August 2018, M&M was the top performing stock in the Nifty. In one of your reports, you highlighted that as well, where you said that Nifty scales new high and M&M leads the year or the year 2002 Nifty pack with the highest returns at 31% CAGR. So let's look at what drove that. We just focus on everything except the rightmost side of the slide right now for just a minute, and we'll get back to the rightmost side. Operating cash flow for that 17 year period was 2,433 crores on average annually. EPS growth was 34% and ROE was 22%. You would agree with me in saying these are fantastic numbers and that's what really resulted in a 31% CAGR uh, of growth over that time period. But as we see what happened on the right-hand side of the slide, as I come back to that, that's where things really fell off a cliff. And we'll have to look at what happened there. Why did that happen? Operating cash flow is still positive at that point because over that three year period, we generated 5,210 crores of operating cash flow on an average annual basis. But EPS fell off a cliff there and so did ROE. Let's go to the next slide to really see the reason for it. You've seen some of this in previous years, but in F17, you probably ignored it saying 1% of PAT is fine as lost from an international subsidiary, not material. But in F18, it was higher at 12%. F19 was 25%. And this year, losses of international subsidiaries actually took away 107% of our profit. We, we had some other gains in exceptional items which offset that to sort of get back to positive. But uh, this was the biggest driver. And uh, frankly, one reason why our EPS has gone down even though operating performance has stayed strong, cash generation has stayed, has stayed strong, uh, these are the losses that we need to address. 
And here's how we're doing it. First, I will repeat that Sangyong and Genzi were 80% of the impairments that we had to take. We're not investing anymore in Sangyong. We have exited Genzi. All other businesses that are loss making internationally are being put in three categories. First category is a clear path to 18% ROE over the next three to five years. Execution will be tracked very closely. If they are in that category, they stay. The second is a delayed or an unclear path to profitability where they have a strong strategic link. A good example there could be Sampo. Agricultural implements, which can have a huge market in India. So the potential gains from that or from technology could be far greater than what we would face in losses or less profits in Sampo. And third is businesses that have an unclear part of profitability and don't have a quantifiable strategic link. Uh, they would be on the exit path, either through a partnership, alliance, or shutdown. Over the next 12 months, and actually at this point, the next 10 months, because I've been promising some of you 12 months since April, so that shall not be a rolling number, uh, we will have all of these businesses identified and categorized. A lot of work has started already uh, and is underway on this front. In addition to that, we have to get back to our growth path. We have seen the value creation over the years that has led to the growth I showed you earlier. Tech Mahindra, Mahindra Finance, Swaraj Engines, Holidays, uh, all of those investments have contributed to our growth. And what we want to talk about today is nine more gems, as I call them, that we can harness value from. These are potential billion dollar candidates. From a power all business, to Mahindra Rural Finance, a rural housing finance rather, Agri, Excello, which also is India's leading company for uh, auto recycling. Mahindra Electric, classic legends and the exciting Java brand. Mobility, Sustain, and some of the leadership we've seen in the we've shown in the solar business. Aftermarket, where we've got a very good physical infrastructure and are starting to build our digital infrastructure now. And really, this can make us a gateway to the largest and fastest growing teams in India. It will allow us to make in India and supply to the world as well, as we will see in the port joint venture. The most important thing for us, though, is governance. That is our bedrock. That is who we are. That is what we stand for. And the importance of being good to all stakeholders not just shareholder value creation. And that is something that keeps us going and, and uh, is most important for us. A lot of awards won in this space. Um, I won't go through the awards in terms of each one, but uh, this is one that I just want to share that uh, as we think about transition of leadership, it is something that will be at the forefront of everything we do going forward. And uh, our values and governance is something that we're completely committed to and will continue to stay committed to. So what is our path forward? We have tightened capital allocation norms. You are seeing that already. We have started action on all loss-making subsidiaries. We are in the process of defining an even clearer narrative for auto. You heard some of that from Rajesh. And we're starting to look at how do we harness further value from our, our, our unlisted gems. So if we can do all of these things well, and we are confident we can, we should be on track to reignite value creation and go back to the 17-year run that we had and extend that hopefully for the next 17 years. With that, back to you, Pawan. Thank you, Anis. Uh, uh, at the cost of repetition, uh, I'm just going to summarize a few high, uh, high points that Rajesh and Anis have made. So on the operating performance, I just want to reiterate that we had a 1% increase in market share in tractor industry and 3.1% increase in commercial vehicle end-to-end. -end. Uh, 
uh, our OPM operating margin was 13% for auto and 19% for tractor, which is same as the year before. And we have some connectivity problem uh, there. So, uh, Sriram, should we start with questions till Pawan comes back? Yes, we could do that, uh, Anish. Okay. Uh, just a reminder to all the participants, you could, uh, you know, use the raise hand symbol to ask a question. So now there are a few questions which have already come up, so I will uh, start uh, doing that. Um, Dinesh Gandhi. Um, Vaibhav, can you unmute Dinesh Gandhi? Yes, sir. Dinesh, you can go ahead. Doing it, sir. Good evening, Dinesh. And Jesse is getting. Yeah, while he's coming there, coming on board, Pawan, are you back as yet? Kapil Singh. Shriram, you could also add the others uh, as panelists in the meanwhile. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm making the panelists. Yeah. So there are in the meanwhile there are some questions that have already come. So probably I will start with an issue. Uh, so in terms of the first question is uh, tractors are witnessing strong rural demand. How do you see the ramp up in production levels and given conditions in the near term? And what is the outlook for the full year? Rajesh, will you take that? Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, as I covered in my presentation, clearly there is a big upside on the rural side and demand has been very robust. Even in the month of May, we had a growth of 2%. Were I on mute all this time? Uh, yes, Pawan. Uh, you had uh, actually gone not just on mute, but the screen wasn't seen. So uh, we were just starting the first question, but given you're back, why don't we hand it back to you for uh, the recap that you had um, started? From the very beginning? Uh, yes, we you just started with the market share and uh, then it froze after. Yeah, sorry, uh, a few minutes to repeat what I said. I'm very sorry to realize I was on mute. I don't know how I was on mute. Uh, so, uh, sorry for repetition, but uh, <clears throat> I was starting off by saying the operation performance for uh, last year. I'm repeating for the things that have been talked about by Rajesh and Anis. Uh, market share increase in uh, tractor and market share increase in commercial vehicles very important for us. Uh, the operating profit margin being 13% for tractor and being 19% for, uh, sorry, 13% for automotive and 19% for tractor, which are, to the best of our knowledge, the highest uh, operating margin of any company in India, for tractor and four-wheeler. Uh, very important that our retail volume in automotive was 10% more than billing, more than wholesale, uh, leaving us only about 10,000 vehicles at the dealership at the end of the year. Uh, we had uh, a PS6 transition that happened very smoothly. Uh, and uh, EBITDA positive for Mahindra Electric, though operationally not very uh, significant, but it is significant that uh, a business that will be the future has reached EBITDA uh, positive for us. Uh, what I also said was that uh, what's important, not so much about what we have done in the past, uh, but what how we're preparing for the future. And as is said often, that crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We have taken that very seriously and using this time to take uh, for reorient in, 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 in many ways. Uh, we have taken many tough calls in capital allocation. Uh, Sangyong uh, was known to you. Uh, we have also announced today that we are exiting from the Gen Z business in USA and looking at uh, you know, all the other uh, businesses that, uh, that uh, Anish talked about. Uh, softly focused on narrative uh, for automotive business so that we don't go left or right uh, from our core. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> shying away though 
from investing in uh, core product development, as Rajesh talked about. FAST, which is farming as a service, is going to be a very important part of our farm equipment business in terms of creating a moat. And the nine gems uh, that Anis mentioned uh, that will create value for us going forward. So we do believe that we have used this uh, difficult time, the challenging time, very well uh, to, to introspect and to take some tough call and orient our business in a way uh, that we get back to the value creation that Anish pointed out, which kind of uh, stopped in August 18. And we are in June 20 now, uh, and hopefully we'll be going back to the same kind of curve that we have seen in the previous 17 years. So thank you. I stop here and now we can start the questions. Uh, yeah. yeah, so the one question was in terms of the tractor demand. What is the outlook for the next year is the question. Rajesh, responding to that. Yeah, I just started answering that. So I was uh, saying that the tractor demand is clearly very positive. And we've seen that in the month of May where we had a growth over May last year. Of course, this is the peak season uh, for tractors. Uh, we are at 80% uh, production capacity now and uh, that's improving as we talk. So uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to ramp up uh, to higher levels. Uh, clearly the way we see it from the tractor side is the determinant of performance will be the management of the supply chain. And uh, we would do our best uh, to put that in place and streamline that to the extent possible. All our suppliers are operational now. And 90% of our dealerships are operational. Yeah. Thanks, Rajesh. Um, Baiba, now can you unmute Dinesh Gandhi? Uh, Kapil Singh is unmuted. First question from Kapil Singh. Okay, Kapil, Kapil you can go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, congrats. Uh, I think it was a great performance in very tough market conditions. Uh, firstly, my question is on capital allocation. Um, and um, I would request Anand to also uh, give some thoughts on the same. Uh, you know, we already have so many investments. And uh, how can you explain in more detail uh, how will we approach capital allocation in future? And is this a uh, policy in response to current conditions or we will maintain this in good times as well? Uh, that's my first question. And secondly, on gross margin performance for the company, it's been pretty strong, uh, both on a QOQ and BioY basis, uh, given the tough conditions. So uh, any color or any one of there? And did we have any one-time loss for clearing BS4 vehicles? Anish, on capital allocation first, and then Rajesh and I will cover the gross margin. Yes, and he would ask for Anand's views as well, so we will uh, we'll go there also. Uh, on Anand will uh, give his views after yours. Yes, on, on capital allocation, uh, this is a policy that will continue. Uh, it is not a change, as I've told many of uh, uh, our analysts and investor friends over the last couple of months. If you look at our 17-year history, uh, we would not have that kind of return if it had not been for good capital allocation during those times. Now, there were some things that didn't quite work out. COVID contributed to some of it, and the internet of subsidiaries really took a big hit. Uh, so our lesson from there is that we have to be very particular about where we invest, make sure that it is generating the returns, track execution closely, and that is, again, the only recipe to get back to the 17-year run we want in the future. So simple answer to your question is the capital allocation will continue to stay strong as we go out. It is not just in the short run. Anand, Anand you're on mute. Yes, um, I'm just starting my starting my video. Am I visible and audible? No. Yes. All right. Uh, well, first on the um, question of whether this is permanent and is going to continue in good times, I suspect, couple, that was not a question. That was very strong advice. And I'll just say that we will take that advice on board. 
Uh, and Anish has already answered to you as the person who will be steering the group from next year. Uh, he's made a commitment that he continue, and I think we'd all hold him to his word. But I should point out again to you from the presentation that Anish made, he did show to you that we had not starved our core businesses at all of capital. There was never any diversion of critical capital requirements from the core business. Um, so that principle has never been violated. Our interesting structure and consolidation shows up very starkly in our now consolidated results. What goes right or wrong in our federation structure. So in a sense, I think clearly we're going to be far more calibrated in our globalization. Uh, I, I, want to lay, I want to make very clear that I don't think we are a company that wants to suddenly become like a turtle and go inwards. Uh, that is a knee-jerk reaction the whole world is seeing. But I think we are people who are going to calibrate our growth and opportunities globally and do them with a very, very strict focus on getting returns as quickly as possible and ensuring value creation and exiting much faster if we find that we are not on track. So those are the points I want to make, that we have never starved our core businesses. Our structure has shown up where we have not succeeded in our globalization. However, we can remain committed to the opportunities of globalization, but in a much more calibrated manner. And we will also fail faster if we have to. And we will also follow a path of much more stringent value creation oversight. I'll stop there. Thank you, Anand. Uh, Rajesh, you want to take the gross margin question and I'll add to that if I have to. Yeah, so gross margin improvement is a function of uh, two or three things. Uh, one is the com commodity prices had stayed benign. Now, when commodity prices are benign in any given period of time, there's always a temptation to pass uh, that off by way of uh, pricing. And uh, both the businesses did not do that. And uh, that's helped uh, to improve the overall margins at a net variable margin level. And that's something we track closely. Uh, we've also looked at all our expenses uh, very, very closely, even in the year F20. And of course, that's being recalibrated with a much uh, stronger lens as we have into F21. Uh, so I would say it's uh, managing the benefits of commodity prices, a series of value engineering uh, projects uh, done on both the sides, uh, which culminated in the full benefit point to point in the last quarter, as well as uh, fixed cost management. Uh, Pawan, would you want to come? The only thing that I want to add is that uh, currently uh, we don't expect any significant increase in commodity prices, and the opportunity that we had probably will will continue. However, uh, we need to uh, perhaps be a little bit uh, careful because we also need to get the industry back on track and therefore not take any aggressive price increases. So we'll have to balance that. Uh, it'll depend on how the industry reacts, how uh, uh, other, other OEMs react and how the customers see it. One thing that I just do want to put on the table so that you guys <clears throat> uh, uh, are clear on that, when it comes to BS6 uh, portfolio that we have now, uh, our effort is that the net variable margin in absolute terms uh, remains same on the weighted average basis. However, uh, there will be a higher denominator. And it may not be possible for us to uh, offset for the higher denominator in terms of percentage margin. So we will try and maintain absolute margin in our product, but not percentage margin uh, when it comes to the BS6 pricing, because of BS6 pricing. And one very important uh, factor in, uh, in margin is the model mix. Uh, because model mix, uh, there is a big variety in, uh, in margin from the worst to the best model. And it all depends at the end of the day of what kind of model mix we get. So last year, we also had good model mix. OK, next question, please. Yeah, Jinesh, you can go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Jinesh. 
Uh, yes, sir. My question pertains to the capex and investment guidance. Uh, so, in the past, we had a three-year rolling targets of uh, fifteen thousand crore capex and uh, seven and a half thousand crore of investment. So, does that change now? Uh, a, given the operating environment and given the capital allocation uh, focus. Uh, second question pertains to the uh, price increases taken in fourth quarter and one Q of five twenty-one YTD uh, in both tractors and autos. And lastly, uh, what are your cost-cutting targets, both in variable and fixed cost side? Thanks, Rajesh. You can take all of these. Okay. Uh, so the first uh, first question I uh, was on uh, the capex and investment in the year F twenty one. Uh, we don't see a capex reduction compared to what we had planned of more than fifteen percent. And the reason for that is that the three big uh, SUV projects that I just spoke about are all at uh, end of cycle uh, uh, of product development. And uh, it uh, is neither prudent nor possible to significantly cut back on those capital expenditures because that is really fortifying our future. So uh, we have made all our F21 plans on a capex which is only 15% lower than what we had planned, and we believe that's the prudent thing to do. As we look at the cycle of F22 to F24, which is the next three year cycle, uh, that's where we would like to see a significant reduction in our capital expenditure. So earlier we were talking about, I think the number you quoted was approximately 4,000 crores per year, which is 12,000 over a three year cycle. And we are hoping that that could come down to 9,000 over a three year cycle for capital expenditure, uh, which will fully then leverage all the investments that we made uh, on our platforms up until now, and also the synergy that we can get on Ford uh, from the Ford platforms. On the investment question, the uh, overall approach will be to keep it to the minimal level uh, based on the uh, communication that Anish has had uh, just com had uh, communicated to all of you, following a very rigorous policy of capital allocation, putting in money only where we really see uh, the gems, as he called it, and uh, building those into bigger businesses. Uh, but otherwise, uh, overall, be conservative on the investment. Uh, Pavan Anish, do you want to add on this? Uh, on uh, variable and fixed. Uh, yeah, I just thought if there's anything you want to add on this. Uh, not on this. Uh, Anish, just on, on this, I will just add that, uh, remember, we have to grow as well. And that's what you've given us credit for in the past. So capital allocation doesn't mean that we will not put capital anywhere. It will mean that we will be very stringent about where we put it, but we have high ambition for growth in many of our businesses, and we are very well positioned in many of the gems that I talked about, and we do see significant opportunities for growth there. Just reiterating, I guess, since this is an important point for all of you, reiterating what Anish said in his presentation, that uh, only the, pro uh, the, the investments which will justify financial return or which have very strong quantifiable Strategic relevance are the only ones that will be supported. Thanks, Pavan. And the next uh, question, uh, Shriram, uh, Shriram, there was a part two to the question. Yeah. Shriram? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the part two to the question, if I get it correctly, is what are the specific actions we're doing on taking on cost management? Is that correct? Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Okay. So, um, Firstly, as Pavan said, uh, you know, we should never waste a crisis like this. And we've learned a huge amount over the last two months on a, the ways in which we can run our business differently. And that starts with looking at every kind of ex expense from uh, the way we travel. I mean, if we've been able to get a market growth in tractors of, uh, in the month of May with nobody traveling to dealerships, uh, it says a lot about how businesses can be run differently. And it's not that we were disconnected. Uh, we, in both the auto and the tractor side, have contacted thousands of customers directly using Teams. Uh, we've been regularly in touch with our dealers on Teams, Microsoft Teams, when I'm saying Teams. Uh, and so we've been very connected, very engaged, 
and that really tells us that there is an opportunity for rethinking the business model uh, and we are aggressively looking at every element of cost uh, we have set up a specific full time team on renegotiating all services contracts uh, so there's a host of actions uh, aimed at reimagining the future not just getting actions in place to manage the next two or three months uh, so whether it's fixed costs or specific material cost reduction targets uh, renegotiations of contracts are all on on the table right now as a new way of doing things yeah so rajesh if i could just add this uh, uh, this answer <clears throat> uh, if there was one positive uh, if there is any positive out of covid 19 it is that many myths have been broken on what we cannot do or what we can do Uh, and this really is going to lead to a uh, very uh, agile business uh, processes a uh, lot of uh, empowerment that the teams would have and clearly uh, clearly lot less travel than what we have what we do and you can just imagine that if travel cost itself uh, if it's cut by 50% i don't see any reason why we cannot cut by 50% uh, that will be among the saving for a company like mahindra and mahindra Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, all the business processes are being revisited. Uh, in fact, uh, in many cases, the need of supervision uh, for many things is being revisited, uh, and uh, and see, do we need so many people to to man something? Uh, and and uh, this will all evolve over the next uh, six months. Uh, but I do see significant potential for saving cost. Just as an example. uh in a given year we do so many communication meet dealer meet supplier meet zonal meet regional meet uh, many of those uh, may not be required and some of those can be easily done on a virtual platform uh, and that each one of them will save uh, money in uh, running into uh, multiple crores uh, the next question is from pramod kumar pulman tech pramod gogat yeah uh, can you hear me Yes, please. Yeah, Pramod. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on a good operation number, and uh, kudos to Anand and the leadership team for some tough calls. Uh, my first question uh, pertains to the uh, uh, to the co- project Kuber. Uh, in the past, uh, we have heard you talk about massive cost reduction efforts. What you're undertaking, both on automotive and farm equipment. Uh, we've already seen quite a lot of this uh, in this year with your uh, 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 solid margin execution. Uh, so, uh, how much of runway do we have more left uh, on the cost reduction side across both automotive and farm? equipment and uh, bringing in ford inside and mvml inside how much of further room do you think you have on the cost reduction efforts here on the core business rajesh uh the answer to that question is that uh, we we always believe that the more you dig into cost the more you will find it and there's never a bottom to the pit and uh, we will we believe there is a big runway still Uh, and i don't think we are best in cost at all okay and uh, the next question is from uh, pramod you have any follow up question first question no okay go ahead sir yeah okay next question is from ben from jp morgan Yeah, hi team. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, two questions from my side, and uh, firstly on again capital allocation. Sorry to be hopping ar- around this topic, but uh, generally when you're looking at investments in subsidies, do you have any? You know, is there any uh, commitment in mind that we don't want to exceed exceed beyond this limit per annum? Because if I look at we did withdraw from Sangyong, but at the same time we are definitely going to subscribe to the rights issue in MMFS. which could mean a similar magnitude of money being invested on the subs so is there some amount which you you know you have in mind that we're not you know this is the cap beyond which we wouldn't be investing in subs and any roe targets that you can commit from a mid term perspective on the console basis um and second question is on the financing side given that you're on you know different segments uh are you facing any issues uh, when the dealerships are opening given the overall environment um on the uh, in the banking environment it's it's a bit cautious so what are your uh, your early readings into the financing uh anish you can take the first one and rajesh the second one 
Sure. Uh, so first, we want to make sure, as Anand said, that the auto and farm businesses are not starved of capital in any form. And uh, therefore, they generate a lot of cash. That cash is being reinvested in that business. Beyond that, our current investments also generate a fair amount of cash, and we typically don't spend all of it. So today, we do have the ability to spend more in many ways. That ability has come down over the last two or three years. And what we would look for is any investment that we make has to meet a financial hurdle. That goes back to your second question, which is what is that hurdle? I would look at that as an ROE of 18%. If it can achieve the ROE of 18%, then it merits that investment. And very often we can get other partners to invest with us as well. Uh, if we feel that we don't want to put all the capital there. Uh, so far, capital has not been a constraint in that sense. What has been an issue, as you've seen in the numbers, is the losses from the international subsidiaries. We want to make sure that the losses are not there. We continue to get returns. If the returns continue to come in, those investments will continue to provide funds to fuel further investments as we go on. But the 18% ROE threshold is the important one. Rajesh, on financing and the dealerships? Yeah, so uh, we, uh, in the month of May, when we started May, we were uh, worried about uh, financing. Uh, May turned out to be much, much better than what we had thought. And the reason we were worried, of course, was that even the financiers, people on the ground were all working from home. And uh, they, in a way, reinvented their model of uh, approving cases digitally. Uh, so the typical verification process that would happen by visiting people, especially in rural India, in their homes to approve a loan all got done uh, with a completely different level of, as Bhavan calls it, of supervision uh, and done remotely. Uh, we, we, I'm just addressing the rural side first and then we'll come to the urban side. Uh, the, uh, the cash flows in rural are pretty good. Uh, and I think uh, Mahindra Finance has really stepped in along with the financiers to ensure that we've brought our payment cycles back uh, on our rural businesses to a level we are very comfortable with right now. Uh, so May was very good. June is going uh, very well as well from a financing point of view. Uh, the uh, On the urban side, uh, as markets open up mainly for the automotive space, we don't really see financing as a big going in constraint. Um, Anish, do you want to bring in a different perspective on how you are seeing financing given? Uh, yeah, okay. thanks, Rakesh. Uh, I, I will just add that Mahindra Finance today continues to be very strong. And the reason for us to do a right software there is to ensure that there is no concern or no issue at all as we go forward from a solvency standpoint or a liquidity standpoint. As you would know, NBFCs are facing lots of problems everywhere. And we wanted to make a statement with Mahindra Finance that there is no problem. And that helps us address financing on both auto and farm. And that will actually be a strong strategic support for us as we go forward as well. Uh, because with a strong Mahindra Finance, uh, as what Rajesh said, we don't see any problems from a financing standpoint. Uh, Rajesh, just uh, one more thing you may want to just allude to or add is about strong collections in the month of May. Yeah, yeah, I, I did uh, did say that, but uh, collections like uh, Pawan is saying were very, very strong uh, in the month of May. A lot of it came uh, through money which uh, came through either dealers bringing in their own money as well as collections from farmers. Uh, and uh, the role that uh, finance companies and like Anish said, Mahindra Finance especially played in enabling that process to happen. Uh, so we, we've really been very, very pleasantly surprised with the uh, collections. And as I said in my presentation, clearly cash was our number one priority as we got into the uh, April, May and even June cycle. That is this year our number one priority over everything else. Gunjan, when, when money comes from dealers, that's a very positive sign for us. Anand, do you want to add anything to it? This person? Um, Gunjan, I just wanted to add uh, something. In a sense, I'm paraphrasing what Anish said. But first of all, the 
investment that we are making in Mahindra Finance, even by itself, we believe not only will it meet the hurdle rate that Anish articulated, but might in retrospect be one of the best investments we will make. Or we will look back and say it's one of the best we've made. I also want you to look at it in the way Anish said, as a strategic investment also. If you look at what's happening in the NBFC arena, there is going to be a substantial shakeout in that field. And those that are left standing with both strong solvency and strong liquidity are going to be far stronger players. And for a company like that to be supportive of our auto and farm businesses, I'd like to urge you to look at that as a very strong differentiator and a facilitator for the growth of those businesses. That's all I wanted to add. Thanks, Bob. Thank Next question. Next question is from Itesh Goyal of Kotak. Itesh, you can go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, no, you have come closer to the mic. Uh, your voice got lost. Yeah, I'm saying thank. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot. Uh, you know, congratulations on a very good set of uh, numbers in this tough environment, and also calling out the capital allocation quite clearly in the PPTs. Uh, what we, uh, what the, what we are wanting to understand is how should we look at the volume trajectory? Like tractor business, we know that it's uh, you know doing well now. Even tractor companies have said that. But how should we look at from uh, FI21 perspective for the auto business? Like you're saying, you know, current capacity utilization is only 30%. Uh, do you see it's a supply issue which gets sorted out? So uh, I think I think we would want to refrain from making any volume projections for this year as yet. Uh, probably towards the end of July, we may be in a better position to understand uh, how things are moving. Uh, unless Rajesh wants to add something to it, that's my view that it will be premature for us to take any call on volume. Yeah, I would not want to get a call on volume right now, but just want to clarify to you that on the tractor side, the reason for the lower capacity utilization right now is the pace of ramp up. And in any case, we need much more vehicles because as we mentioned earlier, our dealer stock is only 10,000 numbers cutting across our entire portfolio. Uh, so we anyway need... Rajesh, you mentioned tractor side. This was auto side. Uh, I'm so I'm so sorry. On the auto side, uh, we uh, I guess old habits die hard. Uh, <laughs> on the on the Bill auto Nam side, <laughs> on the on the auto side, uh, it's really the uh, uh, need to fill back the channel. So we definitely do want to produce much more than we are producing, and that process of uh, capacity utilization being low is the time it's taking to ramp up. Uh, as uh, we don't want to compromise quality as suppliers get into restarting their businesses. So we are not pushing beyond point and uh, we do want the same process to get stabilized in our own plants. Uh, but the desire is to definitely increase the capacity utilization in our auto business. I think this quality point that Rajesh made is very important for anyone to everyone to understand because uh, uh, auto being somewhat more complex than tractor, uh, and many of the suppliers perhaps using a different set of people for uh, their processes than they were using before lockdown. We need to be extra careful, a lot more than we normally have to be in terms of the incoming quality of parts. And that's what Rajesh alluded to, that we don't want to force the suppliers to, uh, to ramp up faster than their ability in terms of quality. Next question, please. Yeah. Next question is from Aditya from uh, HDFC. Aditya. Yeah, hi. Uh, am I am I audible? Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, so just on this uh, APMC reforms which have been announced by the government, uh, is this just a big picture uh, reform which will not reflect in the near term? Uh, the reason I ask is that the state governments also, also have to alter the law. And uh, just for a question for Mr. Mahindra, how does he now see the agri space uh, in terms of farm incomes maybe over the next three to five years? Thanks. Rajesh, uh, you want to try the APMC question? I may add to it after you. Uh, so firstly, we strongly believe it's a very, very long-awaited and fundamentally uh, 
big reform. Uh, one of the biggest problems the farmers in India have is market linkage uh, and the ability to get the right price for their produce. Uh, and that's been something which has been part of our economy for years. Uh, so we believe that uh, this is a very, very strong reform which will transform agriculture and farmer prosperity. Uh, it may take a little bit of time to execute these things, like you said. Uh, but I think we have enough positive uh, demand enablers on the rural side right now for F21. Uh, and all of you know them well, but to quickly recap, very high reservoir levels. We've not seen that in the last many years. A good monsoon outlook at this point of time, excellent rubby quantity and quality. A very good prices that farmers have got, uh, increasing their uh, overall revenues uh, while costs have come down. So farmer profits have improved. Uh, so there are a series of enablers and the very high government spending on agriculture and rural, um, probably the highest in the last uh, eight or nine years. Uh, so there are many demand enablers right now uh, on the rural side. So even if this were to take time, I think it will create a very strong fundamental uh, difference in the whole uh, ecosystem of farm. Pavan? I'll just uh, add to that uh, in the in the announcement that the Honorable Prime Finance Minister had made. Uh, what was said for the agriculture side was really a uh, very uh, strategic uh, and and long term reforms. Uh, the Essential Commodity Act, uh, taking out some of the commodities from there, the APMC and uh, 1 lakh crore of uh, investment support for farm debt infrastructure. All of these are going to work tremendously towards uh, increasing the farm income. Now, obviously, the, the, the key is execution uh, and how well it is executed on the ground is, is going to be the determinant. Now, I've been somewhat involved in some of the uh, meetings with uh, various ministries and government officers. And from what I can see right now, the intent of converting all of this uh, or, or converting all this intent to reality uh, is very high. Uh, and uh, I would hope that uh, that does not slow down. And we do see the, the, the conversion. Uh, it's unlikely that anything meaningful will happen during this quarter uh, this year, but certainly it's a long term benefit that will go long ways in terms of uh, transforming Indian agriculture. Anand, uh, you want to come in for the second part? Yeah, let me just add to the first part. Uh, Aditya, it's, uh, it's interesting you asked this question about the APMC. I uh, happened to be in an interaction with um, the people who formulated this policy, including the FM. And I also, to be honest, when I first saw it, I said, how is this going to be implemented? The same old problem of inertia by the states. And one of the insights the government had, and I'll be honest, I overlooked it. I plan to, in fact, follow this up more closely. They discovered that interstate sales of farm produce is actually a concurrent list item. And I said, fine, then why hasn't this happened before? And the insight of the government is that, well, nobody's really pushed and it might have been a political inertia because of the artiyas and the middlemen and their pull. But what the government is determined to do is actually breathtakingly simple, which is that they've always had the power to enable interstate sales through a concurrent list and digitization now has just made that easier. So I'm frankly, I actually see this as a very, very earth shaking uh, reform. Yes, Pavan is right, it's about execution, but the execution is going to be far simpler. It's not simply that we'll be twiddling our thumbs waiting for the states to play ball. I didn't know about this concurrent list existence, but this government is determined to use what is already a provision in the law. That was the insight that was shared with me. Uh, your second question, Aditya, what was that? Was it a, I, I, it was a broader question about agri, was it? Can you repeat it if you don't mind? <clears throat> Aditya, can you come back? Yeah, hi. Thanks. Uh, no, my question was, how do you see now farm incomes in three to five years time? Uh, do you really think that, uh, you know, they will now actually double? Uh, yes, am I audible again, uh, Sridham? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so Aditya, I'm actually very optimistic after what I've heard and also because of the change in the Essential Commodities Act and taking a substantial amount of 
horticultural crops out of the list. Um, uh, I think that there's going to be a tremendous input of digitization and disintermediation in the in for, for farmers, which should certainly double their income. Will that double the income of the system? No, probably not. Farm incomes uh, as an ecosystem are fairly sticky. Uh, export can definitely boost an overall ecosystem, but if you leave out export, the fact is that the pie may not change dramatically. That will go up and down as it always has with monsoons and with fluctuating fortunes. But one thing is certain, that with this change and disintermediation, the farmers' incomes are going to get disproportionately benefited for sure. And if you look at what Rajesh talked about, the inputs that Mahindra wants to capitalize on with its e-farming business, farming as a service, we are going to focus on using precision farming and other techniques and automation to substantially improve farm income. So do we have a shot at that doubling? Absolutely. And if I could just add, Anand, that uh, uh, the government is uh, uh, very clear that to improve farmers' income, we have to increase export in a big way. And a lot of effort going on right now on how we can ex increase export, not just of commodities, uh, agriculture commodities, but also value added. Um, next question, please. Yeah, there is one question which has come uh, through the chat window. The question is in terms of uh, based on initial bookings, what is the shift being witnessed from diesel to petrol vehicles in compact and large SUV, SUV segments? In terms of BSG, how are we placed? That's a, that's a type of question. Yes, uh, you want to do it or you want to call uh, Vijay for it? Uh, it'll be a good idea to get Vijay in. Uh, can, can Vijay come in and answer this question, please? Yeah, hi, am I audible? Yes. This is Vijay Nakara, who is the CEO of Automotive Division, taken over on 1st of April. Yeah, hi, good evening. Um, uh, you know, I just want to maybe flash back a little bit to the auto show, uh, which happened earlier. This uh, some of you all may recollect that we had actually cased uh, the entire range of gasoline engines that uh, we intend to, uh, you know, bring out as we go forward. Uh, of course, needless to say, to begin with, I think uh, the gasoline engine on the XUV300 uh, has been extremely successful uh, because, you know, as, as you rightly mentioned that uh, with the transition to BS6, um, uh, the demand for gasoline is very, very strong. On the XUV300, the success of that uh, with more than 50% of uh, the volume uh, on the gasoline XUV300. Uh, and as I did mention that uh, we showcased the auto show, the entire range going up to the 1.5 and 2 liter uh, gasoline engine uh, with TGDI technology, uh, which will be available uh, on our products going forward. So going forward, uh, uh, you know, we will have a very, very uh, um, uh, good range of gasoline engines, uh, world class in nature and uh, with excellent performance meeting all the uh, requirements of the customers. Uh, Vijay, I think the question also was how do you see the shift right now in terms of uh, customer buying? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think there are two parts to that. Uh, if you look at it, I think we should break that up into two parts. There is the SUV space and of course then the large SUV space, uh, what uh, is typically classified as UV1 and UV2. Uh, in the compact SUV space, clearly we are seeing a larger shift to demand in clean, as I mentioned, and we did uh, we see that in the XUV300. But on the large uh, SUV, it is still by diesel. And I think that's got to do a lot with uh, the size, weight uh, uh, of the class and category uh, of SUVs, where diesel clearly outperforms a gasoline in terms of delivery of value to car. So currently, that's the way it is that larger SUVs still see higher diesel demand. And uh, compact SUVs are seeing a higher pull towards gasoline, which is where I come back to the point that I made earlier, uh, that we were going forward, we have a comprehensive range, both with diesel and gasoline technology on 
current range of products as well as the future products that are launch. So, uh, since this is a very important question on your mind, uh, I'll just carry forward what Vijay said a little bit more. <clears throat> See, the three engines that we have, which we have talked about in the past, the 1.2 liter, the 1.5 liter, and the 2 liter, uh, they are all ready for launch. Uh, in fact, the 1.2 liter engine is used right now by Sangyong to export to Europe uh, to meet the CO2 requirement in Europe. Uh, the 1.2 liter engine will also go into Ford EcoSport. The 1.5 liter engine is being used by Sangyong and Corando. The 1.5 liter engine will also go into the B platform SUV that Ford is developing right now. That will be a platform that will be for both Mahindra and Ford. And the 2 liter engine has been accepted by Ford for the W601605, uh, the common platform that we have for the C SUV. So, in a sense, all three of these engines have been proven. Two of them actually in the market right now, and one of those uh, by virtue of acceptance uh, by Ford to go into the W605. And it will be in the in the market uh, uh, as soon as we launch the W601, which will be towards the end of this financial year. Um, Doctor, there, there are few questions, few more questions are there. Maybe another five to seven minutes we can take. So we have more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the next question is um, on the tractor. Uh, emission regime changing change is coming for tractors from October first for greater than fifty horsepower segment. What kind of price hike will that bring? Will this lead to a mixed downgrading this year in terms of HP? Will that bring down margins too? Yeah, so the uh, greater than 50 horsepower segment uh, in the case of taxes about six and a half, seven percent of the total industry volume. Uh, so unlike in the case of automotive, uh, firstly, there is not a very big impact if that were to happen. Uh, through the Tractor Manufacturers Association, we have made a representation uh, requesting for that uh, emission norm implementation to be deferred, uh, given the current environment and the crisis uh, that's prevailing. Uh, so that's under consideration. Uh, it's too early to talk about what kind of price we would launch with. Uh, but as I said, it does not affect the overall strategy because it's not a very large uh, portion of the overall portfolio. Do you want to add something? Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, it will get deferred by some time. We don't know how long, but it will get deferred by some time. The next question is from uh, Yogesh, Yogesh Agarwal, HSBC. Yogesh, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, I have just a couple of questions, firstly, on automobiles in the longer term. So you guys talked about the stock price underperforming in the last two years. And I think one of the big reasons has been lost, loss of market share to competition, uh, which who were able to get you know more uh, forward-looking vehicles. And now in the next three, four years, you are further reducing the CapEx uh, uh, spend. So I was just trying to understand how uh, will your auto business catch up with competition? Uh, with the lower spend, will the effectiveness of R&D go, uh, go, uh, will go up or there will be uh, more focus on marketing or something else? So just trying to understand the strategy behind that. I may add to it. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, Yogesh, so just uh, kind of clarifying a few things, building out of my presentation. Uh, we do want to be a core SUV brand. And... Uh, our uh, submission to all of you is let's not track our success based on our market share of the way SUV is defined today uh, because the way SUV is defined today includes a very high percentage of car platform slash carryover products. So that has significantly expanded the size of the SUV pie as defined now, but that does not necessarily make that SUV. So so what is then our strategy? Our strategy is to say, how do we be highly differentiated uh, which, with products which have very high affinity to customers, which leverage the core of what Mahindra is, and that's really true blood SUVs. We believe starting with the car and the whole pipeline of products that we have will give us enough opportunity to create volume growth with a very differentiated portfolio compared to what most other people are going to come in with at the price points at which we will operate. 
So I believe, uh, and we all believe as a team that we have a strong competitive advantage. As long as we play in an area which is core to our brand and we believe our products will deliver on that. Uh, the point on cutting back CapEx, I think is a relative point because we have invested money uh, in the last four years in creating platforms. Pawan just listed some of the powertrain aggregates, uh, but we've really created a very robust platform strategy in place. Plus, we have synergy coming out of the Ford joint venture, and as we've often reinforced, one of the big values of the Ford uh, joint venture is to create synergy in platforms. And if that were not to reduce CapEx, then what would? Uh, so we are really saying uh, our IC engine strategy from a platform point of view is now very robust and well invested in. Uh, we now just need to create more variety and products coming out of that brand it in a very focused manner so we own the core and then invest in the EV strategy. Uh, so that's really the way we are looking at it. We believe hence uh, to your point, all the points work out. Yes, it will be a different way to market. It is reducing capex but not uh, not uh, by virtue of not doing what is needed for the success in the market. And the third is measure us on the success of what we launch and the returns we generate out of that rather than just one metric which is the suv market share Come on, over to you. so i guess you have covered it quite uh, comprehensively i uh, just want to uh, say that uh, in, in a sense our capex cycle uh, is getting over with uh, or the, the the big capex is getting over with the launch of these three products that we talked about today uh, the new Thar, the W601, and the Z101. Uh, and that's the bulk of the CapEx. All of that will be uh, invested in FI21. We are done with complete engine development. We have brand new diesel and brand new uh, gasoline engines uh, uh, at three at three sort of displacements. And nobody has a newer portfolio of diesel and gasoline engines than we do. And therefore, we don't need to invest in core engine technology. We don't need to invest in capacity for engine. We don't need to invest in capacity for vehicles. Uh, we don't need to invest in new platforms. The only gap that we have in the platform is a 4.4 meter uh, kind of uh, kind of vehicle. And that will come from a joint product development that we're doing with Ford, uh, which is a Ford platform called BX772, uh, which will take care of that need for Mahindra also. And therefore, we are we are kind of done with, uh, with the major CapEx uh, that we needed for completing all the nodes, all the nodes that we need to complete for SUV, SUV launches. Also on the commercial vehicle side, we didn't talk about that too much today. Uh, with Blazo, with Furio, with uh, the new bus, with the investment that we have done on LCV, with the investment that we have done on uh, uh, Supro at the lower level, with the investment that's currently going on on the pickup. Uh, again, we are more or less completing our major investment on, on commercial vehicle by the end of this financial year. On tractor side, uh, K2 is a large investment, uh, and K2 will, uh, bulk of it will be over by the end of this financial year. Some will be over by 22. And there also, uh, we have we have made the engine investments in the recent past. Uh, we have made investment in Swaraj tractor also. So the point of it is that it's not that we are compromising with the products for the future. It's just that we are completing a peak of CapEx invest, CapEx cycle. Okay, fine. thank you. Next question is from uh, Binay Singh of Morgan Stanley. Binay, I think you are unmuted. Yeah, uh, thanks team. Uh, One more after this. Uh, thanks team for the opportunity. Uh, congratulations uh, for very good performance, uh, uh, especially in context of uh, what your peers have done. My first question is on the automotive side. Uh, uh, like, you know, we've, we've seen that the rural momentum is clearly visible on the tractor side. Is it also visible in your rural automotive dealerships? Uh, you know, you mentioned that 40 to 50 percent of your automotive portfolio is rural. So, how is the momentum over there? Rajesh? Uh, yes, Vina, it is uh, visible right now on the auto rural side as well. Uh, we have very good momentum visible on Bolero, Scorpio, which are both rural brands. I spoke about pickups as well. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, unfortunately, our challenge uh, is, uh, and that is unique, more unique to us than our competitors right now, is we've really opened with very, very little pipeline inventory. 
so it is going to take us a couple of months to be able to fully leverage the opportunity. Uh, but uh, the demand is uh, visible and uh, uh, you know very much there in rural India for uh, these kind of products. Uh, Vijay, I don't know if you want to add a quick comment uh, on uh, how you see things on Valero. Or... Yeah, uh, thanks, Rajesh. Yeah, I, I, as appropriately put, I think uh, from a rural demand point of view, clearly Scorpio and Bolero are standing out. Um, I think that's one one very good one very big advantage that we have. But I just wanted to add another dimension to this. I think the most obvious expectation would have been this. But uh, you know, many of you all would know that we launched um, the own on platform, which is a really differentiated. A digital buying platform, not necessarily only for inquiry and booking, but for an end-to-end -end, uh, purchase experience, uh, which allows you to do many other things like do your exchange, uh, including get your finance offer letter uh, on our digital platform. And what's very, very interesting is uh, we've got a lot of bookings for Bolero and Scorpio that have come from upcountry India. So one would have expected typically for urban uh, profile customers to be booking online. Uh, but I just wanted to add that point that we are seeing this also as a great opportunity of digital platforms in upcountry rural India. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question. Uh, sorry, uh, somebody saying something? Uh, actually, just one question on Java since uh, no one touched on that. The latest uh, Wahan data shows that Java is doing almost 4,000 units a month, uh, which is um, uh, better than what uh, we expected. Uh, could you confirm that and what's the outlook for that brand? Because that does feature as one of the nine uh, major bets that the group wants to take. Thanks. Can never be wrong. Okay, that, that's good. One, one is the registration data. So there is no, no question. The only, only thing that can be wrong with one sometimes is that there is a two, three day delay. Uh, in from the time the retail happens to the time and it gets booked into one other than that uh, there cannot be any other uh, sort of uh, difference in actual uh, registration and one data so that's, so that's very encouraging number yeah. thank you uh, next question is from uh, sorry yeah any question on tractor um, tractor most of your questions have been answered it's more on the demand outlook is what uh, any questions we could. I'm looking for an opportunity to get Heman Sikka in so that everybody uh, sees his face and knows uh, who uh, the tractor head is because Heman may not have been seen by many of the analysts before. Heman, could you uh, could you just put Heman online so that uh, Heman, maybe you can just say hello if you don't have a question. We'll come back with the next question for Heman. <laughs> Can you hear me? Good evening, everybody. Maybe you can share Happy your to be here. On, on two months. Head of purchase uh, till 31st March. From 1st April, he is head of uh, farm equipment sector. Raymond, do you want to share your perspective? Uh, very much for having me uh, here. And yeah, so Rajesh, I mean, I just want to uh, echo what you and uh, Dr. Goenka have been saying. Uh, I mean, I have uh, come into this role from 1st of April and I've seen the kind of momentum that I'm seeing uh, on the rural side is amazing. And it is because of all the reasons that you have heard. Uh, nothing more to add because we have covered all the aspects. But clearly with this kind of momentum going, we are not looking at only a good June. We are looking at uh, further down the level uh, in the next season also uh, momentum going. Uh, we are running very low on stocks and inventory. So obviously we will be running at full production for three, four months to come and getting prepared ourselves for the next season. Uh, we are having a very good uh, uh, supply side ramp up. In fact, we are now running at close to 85% of our uh, maximum capacity. And that makes us very happy because I don't know about exact numbers for other players, but we would be among the fastest ramp up in the tractor industry uh, in the last uh, uh, two months. Uh, so the team is working very that It's like where machine needs interventions at various levels. So far, so good. And we are hoping to uh, go to 100% level in the next few weeks. So lo looking forward to a season ahead. Thank you. Hey, hey, man, there was one question, which is how are you ensuring financing liquidity, especially for the FES? 
financing. That got answered, uh, uh, Shriram. Yeah. Shriram, we yeah, answered. Yeah. Rajesh had covered that. Uh, yeah, we had covered that. Can you, can you bring in Rajiv Goel for just a minute? Rajiv, 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 Rajiv Goel as a CFO of the automotive sector. As of 1st April, he is CFO of AFS, automotive and farm equipment sector. Rajiv, you have to speak some something, so then you will come on the screen. While, while he's coming on, I just wanted to uh, add that in the press meet earlier, a question was asked on uh, how easy or difficult the transition was on 1st of April. And I pointed out that uh, probably nowhere in the world such a major trans transition of leadership would have happened uh, when, when everybody is working from home. Uh, yet, uh, I don't think we missed a beat. Uh, and that's the strength of a leadership team at Mahindra. Uh, and since everyone in the new uh, leadership role uh, is uh, homegrown uh, uh, and, and, and there are no outsiders who came in, the transition became that much easier because everyone knows everyone uh, knows Mahindra culture, Mahindra way of working. And we had uh, almost like a seamless transition in spite of everybody working from home. Okay, so uh, Sriram, uh, do you have a last question or shall we wrap up now? Yeah. There's a last question from Chirag and that's the last question. Chirag, sure. Chirag has the last word. Okay, Chirag. He's dropped out. Dropped out? Okay. okay, I think there's a A share call also, so some people started logging out. So, okay, all right, uh, go ahead. Uh, you want to summarize anything, Sriram, or shall we? Uh, no, I think uh, no. I think thanks a lot for uh, everyone for participating and uh, having a good set of questions. And uh, there are a few more questions which are uh, probably some data-related questions which we would respond uh, separately to uh, people who ever has asked. And uh, and if there is anything which is important, we will put it on the website. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, taking your time. And I also thank uh, uh, Anand, Pavan, Nanish, Rajesh, and all the senior management people to be here and taking time and being here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.